Hey friends, and welcome to this week's episode of the U-Turn Podcast. This is your host, Ashley Stahl. I'm a counterterrorism professional turned career coach, speaker, and Forbes blogger, and I created the U-Turn Podcast because, let's face it, every now and again, we realize that we're living life on autopilot, and it's time to wake up and make that U-Turn in your life. So prepare to go deep with some of the most transformational people I know, here to help you grow and upgrade your mindset, whether it's in work or love. Also, be sure to stick around for the end of every episode where I'm going to reflect on the conversation and offer actionable coaching insights to have a real impact on your life. In the meantime, we've opened up access to three free e-courses on uturnpodcast.com. So head on over there if you want to land a new job you love, find your purpose, or launch your dream business. All of these courses are totally free. All you got to do is head on over to uturnpodcast.com. That's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N podcast.com. Now let's get started with this week's guest. It was almost like the harder I worked at trying to find love, find the one, have this amazing relationship, the more painful it became and the more crash and burn relationships I had. And I don't know if anyone else can relate to that, but it's like it's almost the thing you want most can be the thing that's most elusive. Hey everybody, it's Ash here and I have Matt Bugs. He is best-selling author, a speaker, and an expert dating coach. Really the master of helping women understand the minds of men. You've seen him on the Today Show, CNN, Headline News, and he's reached over 50 million women worldwide. So obviously we're going to have him on the show to talk about how to create attraction. And God knows I'm going to be going everywhere with him because I'm going to have so many questions for myself that you're probably wondering too. But before I go on the deep dive, uh, I have to welcome you, Matt. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you, Ash. It's good to be with you. Yeah, this is, I mean, you know, everybody who's been listening knows that I've been dating. So it's funny because I ask questions that are pain points for me. And then people always write in and say, thanks for being so honest about that, because I'm going through that too. So um, how to create attraction is something that I know applies for the single ladies, as well as people in a relationship to keep the attraction. And I'm so curious, like, what got you to this place, you know, before we dive into some of your steps? that you have this fascination and passion to help women find love? Yeah, that's a good question because I really do believe that the human condition, every single one of us has that longing for partnership. We have that longing for love. I mean, it's it's inborn in us uh, when we come into this world. And some de- to more degrees than others, actually. Some people feel more independent. I was born a little hopeless romantic as a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> I love my favorite movie was Robin Hood because of the relationship he had with Maid Marian and he was going to save the day. And, and I just had for I was, from the earliest memories I can remember was wanting this relationship. And as life would have it, it was also the, the thing that eluded me the most. I would have success in sports. I would have success in school. I would have success later in business. And it was almost like the harder I worked at trying to find love, find the one, have this amazing relationship, the more painful it became and the more crash and burn relationships I had. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anyone else can relate to that, but it's like, it's almost the thing you want most can be the thing that's most elusive. And I found myself in an effort to discover what was going on in me. Because I was born in a personal development family where we were all learning how to create results and my parents were really into that. And one of the tenets when you are a seeker and wanting to create your own results, one of the primary principles is the understanding that you are at the center of your results. That people either live by a belief of responsibility or a belief of victim. Either I am co-creating my results with life or that I that life is happening to me and that I'm a victim of what's going on. And so I knew that I was co-creating my results, that I'm at the center of this, I'm the common thread of all these relationships that are not working out and what was going on in me. So I found myself at this personal development week-long retreat and it was day four, and this is a day that will forever change my life. And I'm sitting in a row of chairs and there's 50 men uh, in these row of chairs, there's a hundred of us at this event. And so all, all the men were sitting in these chairs and there were women standing in front of us. And the facilitator goes, all right, guys, we're going to play a game. And this is called the Island game. 
Gentlemen, you each have a clipboard and a pen and a piece of paper. Ladies, your job is to answer this question. If the guy in front of you was the last man on earth to choose from, would you want him stranded on a deserted island with you or would you prefer to be alone? Ladies, all you can answer is yes or no. And I want you to go down the line and vote on every man who's sitting down. And as one of the guys who's sitting down, I looked to my left and my right and the other guys were looking at me and were like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> like awkward. <laughs> like this is, oh my gosh. Okay, here we go. And she said, gentlemen, your job is simply to keep a tally of the number of yes votes and the number of no votes you get. So I'm in my mid twenties at this time. And, and, uh, so the women come down, they start voting. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And we start writing our numbers down. And when it's all said and done, the facilitator says, all right, gentlemen, I want you to stand up and order yourself on the right. I want the man who's got the most yeses all the way down to the left to the man who's got the most no's. And so we start comparing our, our numbers and I ended up second to last with the most no votes. And what was was really interesting experience, I felt ashamed, Mm -hmm. I felt embarrassed, I felt sad, and there was a small spark of feeling grateful because finally I was getting an answer. Finally, I was getting like, okay, I thought that, like, I thought I'd be voted yes. I mean, honestly, I was looking at my numbers like, oh, I have to be down by the yes votes, you know? (laughs) My perception of myself And what was really going on in my interaction with women were completely different. And it's something that we have to be aware of that often it's hard to see the picture when we're the ones in the frame. Yes. And so the facilitator was brilliant. This was actually, it was a safe place. It was a loving place. And at the same time, I'm feeling scared and embarrassed and ashamed. And she said, is there any guy who's surprised by where he's standing? (laughs) (laughs) So I raised my hand. I'm like, yeah. And she goes, great, Matt. Thank you for being courageous enough to raise your hand. Ladies, is there anyone here who would be brave enough to share why they voted no on Matt? Wow. And all these hands flew up in the room. Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) They're like worst nightmare, you know? (laughs) This is like a bad dream. (laughs) But... And at the same time, there was that part of me that was like, I'm okay, I'm going to get some answers. Like, I haven't been able to find love. Like, nothing's been working. Like, ladies, tell me. Ken Blanchard has a great line where he says, feedback is the breakfast of champions, right? Yeah, but that's a real personal development professional right there. Being like, (laughs) oh, good, feedback. I would just fling myself off an emotional cliff by that point. Okay. So one by one, these women stood up. And one by one, they said basically the same thing, is that they felt judged by me. Wow. And the strange part about that was I wasn't judging them, but I knew exactly what they were talking about. I had love for everybody else but myself. I was so critical of myself. I was so judgmental of myself. Like I couldn't make a mistake. I would beat myself up. I was my worst enemy in my mind. And yet it was that behavior, that mindset that had helped me achieve results in sports. It helped drive me to be in the gym later than anybody else. It helped achieve results in school. That mindset can help you achieve results in business. The challenge is that mindset sabotages relationships because what ended up happening was my major dominant vibe, the vibe I was putting out was one of judgment, was one of criticism. Like that's how I was treating myself. And I can't treat someone else differently than how I'm treating myself at the core. And so they all shared that and I, I thank them for their feedback. And that night, I remember we were staying in a big, the big cabins out there and no walls, really just a big bunch of bunk beds. And I'm in with a bunch of other adult men and, and I've got tears streaming down my face, soaking my pillow. I'm on this top bunk and I'm crying and I'm trying not to be heard by anybody. You know, I don't know if you've ever tried to cry quietly. So yes. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, I did that at the Pentagon all the time. I'm like, I'm playing with the big leagues. Got to cry in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and in the middle of that, of the, what it was was just this release. It was a release of emotion, a release of the criticism. And it was so honestly therapeutic. And in that moment, I made a decision that I was going to learn, number one, how to restore my relationship with myself. And number two, I was going to learn what creates deep and lasting connection. These women didn't feel connected to me. That was a big theme. Like they not only felt judged, but I was like, I don't feel like I can connect to you. So what is it that creates deep and lasting connection? Because that's ultimately what I wanted. 
the most. And yet it was the thing that I was pushing away the hardest unknowingly. So long story short, I, I went on a journey. I spent the next many years of my life over six years of my life researching this. And the biggest trip we went on, we went 12,000 miles, my best friend and I interviewing America's greatest marriages, couples who had been happily married for over 40 years. And I wanted to ask them my burning questions about how do you create deep and lasting love, deep and lasting connection. And what I learned from these couples completely changed my life, shifted how I related to myself, my relationship with myself, opened me up to true intimacy and connection. And uh, we, we got a book deal to write that book. It's called Project Everlasting. Two bachelors discover the secrets of America's greatest marriages. <laughs> oh my God. So good. The subtitle so, is everything. There you go. So the, uh, Simon and Schuster published it. And the irony of this whole thing is this beautiful story because on the very last stop on our book tour, I ended up meeting my wife and we have been able to enjoy an amazing marriage. We're seven years married. I have a four year old little girl, a one and a half year old little girl, and a two month old little son. And I'm so grateful for the people who showed up in those interviews to bestow their wisdom and serve me. I mean, I wrote the book for myself, quite honestly, and so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for the, for the kid who went to that personal development seminar. And I'm grateful to be a bearer of a message. My purpose and passion in life is to help people cultivate first the connection with themselves so that they can create that connection with others and experience deep the deep love that they want in whatever form that looks like for them. And that's what I've dedicated my, my life to. That's my purpose and my mission. And, uh, and so I feel very blessed to be able to do that. So amazing. It's funny. I've heard some version of it's hard to see the picture when you're in the frame. I was just saying the other day, it's hard to read the label when you're in the jar. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it is really tough to right. see where you stand without feedback and how incredible that you use that as a quest to find results for yourself. But I know not everyone comes from a personal development family. So you probably are in an environment where it was encouraged to up your game all the time. But I love that you talked about self-love because when we were talking before we started recording, you said that that was really the first bullet on how to create attraction. And that term is thrown around a lot, you know, and I used to think it was something just for yoga classes, self-love, but now right. I've been hearing it more and more. So I'm so curious, what does that mean to you? What does that mean for everybody's listening? Um, to cultivate self-love, especially as it relates to attraction. We are programmed, our brains are 4 million years old, and we are programmed to seek out pleasure and to avoid pain. That's how we survive. When we have painful experiences, our brains are hardwired, our in instincts are hardwired to avoid those painful experiences. Well, inevitably, in relationships, we have painful experiences. I mean, it's just the landscape of the category of life. You know, they're going to be until you're going to break up or be broken up with everybody until you meet that person you spend the rest of your life with. It's just the way that it goes. So what ends up happening is we we guard ourselves. We protect ourselves. We'll go into relationships with a shield and and ultimately what that does is that shield keeps out the pain. But the problem is it also prevents the love from getting in. And when we are born, every one of us, almost every single person's major limiting belief or paradigm is some level of I'm not good enough. So whether you're I'm not attractive enough, I'm not young enough, I'm not old enough for the women who, you know, they want to have kids, they're in their 30s. And they haven't met the person yet. They, the guys are constantly going for younger women. They're like, I'm not young enough. I don't have what they want. If in a, your job career, you're like, I'm not smart enough. I'm not skilled enough. Whatever it is, the I'm not enough paradigm gets lodged in and it prevents us from being our best. It prevents us from taking the action that will actually lead us to the result. It prevents us from getting online dating. It prevents us from really opening up and letting the other person see us. In order to have real connection, there has to be the place to connect to the real you, the authentic you. And that takes vulnerability. And that's scary because when you're vulnerable, you have the ability to be hurt, right? And so we're trained not to allow ourselves to experience that pain. And when we're babies, Every one of us has the I'm not enough in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean it has to control you. It's important to know you are more powerful than any of those limiting thoughts and those limiting beliefs. Anything that ever happens to you, you're more powerful than that. And when we're babies, we have to have our parents' love to survive. I mean, I have a two-month-old. If we don't love him and we just decide not to feed him, he can't feed himself. 
he can't change himself. He's stuck. He can't even move. He's laying there. I mean, this is sort of a great time in life because we can leave him a little bouncy, go kick di- cook dinner, we come back, he's still there. And uh, he's in, you know, he's right there. We can see him. Not like we're leaving our child, but... <laughs> <laughs> You're like, disclaimer, our child is disclaimer, fine. <laughs> he is safe. He is healthy. But the point is that if our parents don't love us, that we're, we will die. So that paradigm gets lodged in from a very, very early age that we have to be loved in order to survive. Yes, that makes sense. It's a literal thing. The kids cannot survive alone until a certain age. That makes sense. That paradigm then gets linked, even though it's not accurate, it still sits in the recesses of the subconscious mind. And what it will do is it will communicate to you, if you don't get loved by this partner, if you get rejected by this person, the subtext of all that is if you get rejected, you're going to die. It's not safe. You're not going to be okay. It's not safe to get rejected. It's not safe to be abandoned. So there's this intense fear that we have around the attachment and the approval of other people's love. So how do we break free from that cycle? When we talk about what is self-love, self-love is the feeling of safety. Self-love is the feeling of safety and freedom from the idea that you aren't enough unless you're loved by that other person. Self-love is the feeling and the knowingness that you are enough just because you are who you are. Just because you're a precious, amazing, beautiful human being on this planet that's unlike any other person on this planet, unique unto yourself, it's a beautiful expression of life, just by means of that, you are enough. And that when you can connect to your source of love that comes from within, and it doesn't come from somebody else, it's not connected to the opinion and the approval of some guy on Tinder or the opinion and the approval of some dude you've been dating for a couple weeks, that's not your source of love. Now, is there... Is that one source of love? Sure, but it's not the source of your love. That when that comes from within, it comes from first being able to approve of yourself. There's an amazing thing that happens. When you are so filled up with love because you accept the parts of yourself that are not easy to love, the parts of ourselves that feel broken, the parts of ourselves that don't feel attractive, the parts of ourselves that feel ugly, and you're willing to love yourself in the midst of all of that, then what ends up happening is a sense of freedom and expression, a sense of relaxation that happens because you're not worried about whether or not the other person likes you because you already like yourself. You're able to relax. You're able to be playful. You're able to be present. You're able to express life in the fullness that is you. And if there's one thing that's highly attractive, we're talking about generating attraction, there's a couple of really important psychological triggers that that happen for men. Number one, and it really just happened, this one happens for all of us. Whenever we see someone living life full out, we feel an expansion of life in us, and that feeling of expansion of life is attractive. I'm just listening to you, and I'm thinking about, you know, how there's self-love and then there's self-abandonment, right? Which is what it looks like when you're attached to somebody else's approval and, and you're not willing to stand in who you are or the knowing of what you truly are. And I'm so curious, what does it look like when somebody has self-love? Like what is the outer reality when it comes to their relationship dynamics or their dating dynamics where it's like, oh, this is somebody that loves themselves? That's a very good question. So let's talk about what does that look like in practice? Yeah. Right? Like the real when the rubber hits the road. Okay. Let me give you uh, two things that immediately come to mind. I mean, this is a, is a big topic. First thing, when There's a rejection that happens. Guy doesn't call you back. Guy stops, gets slow to text, or a guy rejects you, says, I'm not interested in you anymore. And I'll give you a story about this in just a moment. Where does your mind go? If you are growing in your self-love and you've got a lot of work to do, then you're, a lot of people, what happens is their mind goes to, there must be something wrong with me. Why didn't he call me back? What did I do wrong? And they'll skim through their texts. They'll look at what they did, like what they sent. They'll start questioning themselves. He didn't call me back. What's wrong with me? They're like, I'm not. And then it's the I'm not enough voice kicks in. Yeah. I must not be smart enough. I must my, da, 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 da. All of that is going to happen. The key is when you're loving yourself, what you do is you interrupt that voice and you replace it with instead a loving voice. Because here's the truth. The truth is 
more times than not, it's not that there was anything wrong with you. There was something wrong with him. He's not ready for a relationship. He's not loving himself. He's not secure in himself. Or it doesn't have anything to do with you. It's the connection of the two of you isn't right. And that it's the universe removing him from your path to make room and space for someone absolutely amazing to come into your life. See, we get to choose the perspective and the story we tell ourselves. One is going to drag you down. The other is going to support you in moving in the direction you want to go. And so as we challenge these limiting beliefs, that's the first way that you love yourself Mm -hmm. is by choosing the loving thoughts that will support you. In other words, one easy way to do it is to say, okay, what would my best friend who absolutely loves me, thinks I'm amazing, what would that person be telling me right now? And be your own best friend instead of your own worst enemy. The second way that you love yourself is by self-assertiveness, standing up for yourself, declaring what you want. Instead of being quiet, not wanting to rock the boat, not wanting disapproval. So in other words, communicating your standards to a man. Say, no, I'm not going to sleep with you on the third date just because you want to sleep with me. Someone who doesn't love themselves will hope that it's okay, will hope that he loves her when they'll sleep with him, fingers crossed that it's all going to work out, and then it doesn't work out, and then she beats herself up because she she didn't do what she knew she needed to do. Because here's what happens. When you take a stand for yourself, it's something as small as the waiter brings your order, and it's the wrong order, or you ordered eggs, you didn't want cheese on your eggs, and there's cheese all over your eggs. There's that voice in your head that says, should I actually ask for what I want here, or should I just let it go? If the reason you're letting it go is because you don't want to make a scene or be judged by the other person or or see the look of disapproval in their eyes, then what you're doing is you're communicating to your subconscious mind that you don't matter, that you're not worth it. And that lowers your sense of self-love. That lowers your sense of self-esteem. But the, the converse is also true. If you're willing to say, no, I ordered this. I deserve to have the eggs the way I want them. Or, no, I'm not going to sleep with you. I deserve to have, at this point, I deserve to engage in intimacy with a man when we are deeply connected and fully committed to one another. That's what I want. Now, I don't have any judgment. It's whatever you want. The point of this is when you take a stand for what you want, that self-assertiveness, that being direct, that communicating your standards, what that does is that shows your subconscious mind that you do matter. It increases your sense of self-esteem. And here's the fascinating thing. Both of these things, we talk about attraction triggers, right? When you have that sense of aliveness and freedom and safety because you love yourself to be who you are. It attracts men because they sense that sense of aliveness. But the other thing is that when a woman has her own sense of safety, what's imprinted on us men is that our job is to provide and to protect. So when a woman already comes into this relationship feeling safe, subconsciously we feel like we're adequate in doing our job, that we can actually make you happy. It makes us feel better about ourselves. What a trick. What a trick. (laughs) And we're not even the ones doing it, but we we assume that we are because we're men. (laughs) So funny. You know what this also is really making me think a lot about is the standards we keep and hold for ourselves and the way we communicate them. So for example, especially those of you guys who are listening, You know, I have friends of all variations when it comes to how comfortable they are with their sexuality or how soon they'll sleep with somebody. And what I've found is that I totally respect my girlfriend who looks at me and says, yeah, I don't mind sleeping with him on a one night stand. I don't mind. That's her standard. And I have no story about her, her worthiness. She's comfortable with it. She feels she's a sexual person. She's comfortable with it. But what has been really interesting to me is right on. Exactly. It's like, cool. That's what you want in life. And that's what you can go get. But the problem I've found is when somebody breaks their own standard. And so that's the friend who sits with me and says, you know, I really don't want to have any sex with somebody until we've been together a while. And then next thing I know, it's the second date and they sleep together and it became a slippery slope and it happened. It's almost like I wonder if men and women can pick up on that dynamic where somebody is abandoning the standards they've set for themselves. I'm guessing that that is a reflection of not loving yourself. So it's not about how loose you are with sex. It's about, or anything really. It's just about how committed you are in the standards you create for yourself is what I would assume. 
Oh, absolutely. And because we can all pick up on the energy of the other person. And if the energy of the other person isn't loving themselves, yeah. then that actually makes it harder for us to love them yeah, as well. Exactly. It's a subconscious communication of like, oh, if they're not loving themselves, what's wrong with them? Even though there's nothing wrong, that's the what's communicated right. in the mind. So let me give you a quick example of this because I think this just epitomizes um, – with the strength that comes from being your best friend and being assertive. I do a coaching program called Manifest Your Man. And this woman named Jennifer is in this program. She was a professor, late 30s, didn't want to wait for a man to have children. So she did uh, IVF, had two twin boys or a set of boys. And then the paradigm became, you know, I'm in my late 30s. I've got these two boys. No man's going to want that responsibility. Oh, wow. So she ended up shifting that and completely telling a new story about how amazing she is and what a beautiful life she can offer a partner. And she, for the first time in five years, went on a date with this guy. And she said, this guy wasn't quite my style, but he was good looking enough. We went on a date. And then I kissed him and she goes, I had so much chemistry for this guy. It was the best kiss I've had in five years. Then they dated for a couple of weeks. She, she tells me about that on a coaching call. A couple weeks later, we get back on, and she goes, I have to tell you what happened a couple of days ago. So remember that guy that I told you about? Da, 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 da. I said, yeah. She goes, he calls me, maybe this was like three days ago. He calls me and says, I have to be really honest with you, Jennifer. I have met somebody who's in her late 20s, and I am so incredibly turned on and attracted by her that – I have to go and explore this other opportunity. I didn't want to do it without being honest and upfront with you. And if that doesn't work out, then I want to date you because you're the kind of woman I could marry. But right now in my life, in the stage, I want to just explore this. And so imagine how you would feel. Oh, God. Every trigger. Age, children, all of it. Age, children, mm-hmm. not enough, not pretty, not sexy, all of that, right? Mm-hmm. But she had been working on, so she goes, so she goes, part of her just dropped to the floor And at the same time, another part of her said, wow, I just attracted a man who instead of cheating or lying has the balls to actually be honest with me and tell me what he wants. Mm. So she goes, hmm, that's interesting. She goes, I never expected this, but I was in this amazing place of peace and knowing this, that it was either this guy or someone even better still. So because he wasn't pursuing us, that must be somebody even more amazing. So she told him, I said, I said, all right, I... Bless this. Go ahead and go for this other woman. And it shocked him. He was like, well, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't. And no, no, no. You said go, go for this other woman. So she let him go. She goes, I was so proud of myself for how I dealt with that phone call. I was walking on air that afternoon. She goes, I would have been on the floor crying for three weeks prior. She said that night I went online and I reached out to the hottest guy that I could find. He responded to me that night. We got on the phone. He asked me out for a date the next night. I went out with this guy. We kissed at the end of that guy. This the guy is tall, dark, and handsome. My style, he's amazing. We had a, a kiss that was even better than that other guy. And now I'm dating this guy. That was two years ago. They're still together. They're now living together. Amazing. The next day, she found this other guy. Instead of being laid out crying on her floor based on the degree of how what the story she was telling herself and the degree of love foundation she had created. Yeah. And I'm guessing we don't think she would have found him if she was busy crying on the floor. So that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of women right now are probably listening and thinking like, okay, but how, how do we do this? It's so, it could be daunting, the thought of learning how to love yourself, because they could look in the mirror and say, I'm amazing, and I'm going to tell myself what my best friend says, but really inside, they don't feel amazing. So what, right. are, what are some ways to get into congruence with what you say and how you really feel? I'm going to give you actually one script. So all the women who are like, oh, I get pressured to have sex, and men want to move things forward physically before I do. Now, some of you ladies listening, I know you're the ones who are like, you know, pedal on the metal you you want to uh hook up and that's totally cool and that's all good and for those of you who are feeling like men progress things physically sooner than i would like let me give you a skill set right now to be able to keep the connection in the relationship with him while communicating your standard because the question was how do we cultivate this It's two things number one it's reframing the story when the story wants to tell you you're not enough 
you reframe it and remind yourself that you are enough and give yourself whatever your best friend would tell you in that moment. Do that. That's no small thing. It's not easy to do. It's one of those things that people poo-poo. They cast it aside saying, ah, that's personal development crap. And yet they won't do it. But it works. The second thing that you do is you stand up for yourself in the areas that matter to you. Whether it's as small of a thing as getting served the wrong food, whether it's a conversation that goes the wrong way and you know that you need to have another conversation to actually clear the air with that person, or whether it's a standard in a relationship that you're wanting to maintain. So let me give you something you can say to men. Whether when you've date, you're, you're on a date, let's say it's the second date, and you go back to his place, you guys are having drinks, and you're making out on the couch, and it feels really good, and all of that is fine for you, and then he says, let's take it into the bedroom. What can you say? In that moment, to not kill the relationship or the mood, but to maintain your standards. You're cute and I wish, but I'm not. <laughs> Probably something so, more graceful than what I would say. Let's go, Matt. <laughs> so so here, it's really important because you have to remember men are human too. And we have all kinds of insecurities too. And we want to be liked. We want to be loved and accepted. And just like you. And so... What you can say is, let's say you're enjoying your time with this guy. You want to continue seeing this guy. And you think that down the road you will hook up with him if things continue to go this good. So you put your fingers on his lips. You look deep into his eyes and you say, you don't know how bad I want to do that right now. The reason that's important is because it shows him that you are sexually turned on by him. You want him as a sexual partner and you feel the way he feels. So you guys are on the same page. Then you say, and that's moving a little fast for me. I reserve being intimate with someone and then name your standard, whatever that is. I reserve being intimate with someone until I'm in a committed relationship with them or or we're exclusive and we've got a deep level of connection. And this is going good, but we're not quite there yet. Let's see how this goes. There are all kinds of triggers in there. Number one, you're accepting him. He's, you're approving of him and his sexuality. One of a man's greatest fears is to be inadequate in bed with you is to be inadequate like you don't he doesn't turn you on right so you're telling him he he turns you on the second thing you're doing is you're communicating your standard but the third thing you're doing by saying we're not quite there yet let's see how this goes is you're giving him a challenge and men respond to challenge we love a good challenge we love not for the sake of winning win it's just how our biochemistry is well wired up when we achieve a goal or, or produce a result especially when it's connected to a challenge preceding that, we get this rush of neurochemicals, the dopamine, the norepinephrine. We get this whole rush of uh, neurochemical cocktail that floods our system that helps us feel amazing and feel like a man. And so when you challenge us to say, let's see how this goes, guess what he's going to do? He's going to step up. If he wants to be with you, he's actually going to step up. Mm. And he's going to, and this invokes what I call the alchemy of sex drive men's sexual area of their brain, the area that governs sexual pursuit is actually 250% larger. It's two and a half times larger than that of a woman's brain, which is often why men want to go faster sexually early in the relationship. Not always. Now, granted, these you know rules are made to be broken. This is not a one size fits all thing. But generally, we see that in relationships. I've been coaching women for over 10 years. So the fact that he's sexually turned on by you, the fact that he wants you sexually doesn't make him a bad guy. That makes him a potential husband. (laughs) Or just a guy in general, yeah. (laughs) Or just a guy in general because we don't want to marry a woman that we're not wanting to have sex with or turned on by. Like that's our wife, right? It's like we want to marry that woman that we're super turned on by. And know that you can actually transform or transmute some of that sex drive into emotional connection by giving him the challenge to do so. Hey, U-Turners, so sorry for the quick interruption, but I want to make sure you know that this episode has been brought to you by the Job Offer Academy, our e-course to help you land a new job you love. So if you're sick of applying for jobs and never hearing back, and you'd like to try a free version of our job hunting course, just head on over to U-TurnPodcast.com slash job offer. That's Y-O-U-T-U-R-N podcast.com slash job offer. Now let's get back to this week's episode.
You know, when we were talking about how to create attraction, another thing you talked about is the law of polarity. And I feel so much polarity just like in the dynamic you're describing of how to communicate with somebody. So I would love to learn for everybody, what is the law of polarity and what does this mean in the dynamic of creating attraction? So just like opposite, just like in, uh, in electrodes, there's polarity to a battery. You've got the positive charge and you've got the negative charge. Inside each of us, we have polar energies, both men and women. We both have masculine and feminine energy. And I know there's a lot of teaching around this now, whether you're a listener and you're well-read on this topic or whether this is new to you, it's really important that this is not a farce. This is actually uh, real and it works. You've got both masculine and feminine energy inside of you. And based on how you were raised, who you were raised by, how you've learned to be successful in life, you lead with one or the other. Highly activated people know how to switch back and forth between a masculine and feminine energy. Yes, it's like a trademark of an evolved soul, I think. Somebody who can step into whichever one is required in the situation. It's beautiful. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and but those energies, it's important to know, those energies are polar energies, meaning they attract one another. So if you want a masculine man, learn how to activate your feminine energy. If you want a feminine man, Learn how to activate your masculine energy. There's no right or wrong here. You get to have whatever you want to have. So let's just say if you want to activate your feminine energy, and I do a lot of teaching on this and, in fact, have a great resource, a great gift for everybody at the end of this podcast on five qualities that they can activate that high-value men find totally irresistible. And so we'll we'll give that away at the end. That's free. It's just a gift from me to you. Mm -hmm. One of the central tenets Oftentimes I find, you know, it's managers, it's business, it's leaders, it's strong personalities that have found a lot of success in school, business, career, exercise that put on their masculine energy and they don't know how to take it off. They don't know how to take off their manager's hat when they get into a relationship. And masculine energy is cognitive energy where feminine is feeling energy. So it's the difference between your head and your heart. So masculine energy is visioning energy, is decisive energy, is creating the plan, casting the vision, making decisions, and driving it forward. It's production, it's achievement, it's strategy, it's it's all of that. Feminine energy is intuitive energy, it's receptive energy, it's the the emotional side of what it is you're doing. And so really highly evolved business leaders and highly evolved people in relationships are able to access their in- intuition. Does this feel right? Does this not? Like Richard Branson, amazing business leader. Uh, If you've ever read any of his books, he talks a ton about the gut feeling. That's the intuitive side. So masculine energy is providing energy. Feminine energy is receptive energy. And if you're with a guy who likes being in his masculine, that builds attraction. Because as he's in his masculine, he feels really good about himself. He's serving you and your feminine. That creates this amazing polarity, this amazing attraction. We all are more attracted to people with whom we feel like better versions of ourselves when we're around them. So as he feels like a better version of himself in his masculine energy around you and your feminine energy, that's going to create this magnetism between the two of you. And one thing you can do, if we make this really practical, you... Create a space by making a request for something that you would love and then allowing him to provide it for you. Yes, I love this. So that that request becomes the opening. You say feminine energy is about receptivity. Masculine is about providing. That request say, hey, you know what? I would really love it. Um, I'm really craving sushi right now. I would love it if you would take me to go get sushi sometime. So you you lay the challenge before him. The gauntlet has been set. There's a challenge. You've created the space, and now it's up to him. But now you've got to release control. You've stated what you would love, but you're not stating how it gets done, when it gets done, what route you're taking, where you're parking. As you get there, all of those things, you're, you're trusting him to do those things. And as now men have to earn the trust. I know a lot of guys don't lead, and it pisses you off because they don't step up and they don't lead. Mm-hmm. That's the challenge of men today. Men, we have to learn to lead. 
We have to become better leaders, more decisive leaders. We have to create a safe place so that our women can actually relax in our arms. They can relax in our presence. We have to tell them the plan, tell them what's going on. And when we do, our women can fully surrender into their feminine and fully activate that level of joy and love and beauty and presence that comes from that. But we have to make it safe enough for them to do so. This is a partnership that has to happen, right? Another friend of mine caught herself. She would go go on a date with a guy and then... As they were driving, she was like, I just noticed I was like wanting to be helpful. And so I was telling him which exit to take. Oh, hey, our exit's going to come yes, up here. You, know, you want to totally get in like, the right lane. You probably want to get out of the carpool, go get in the right lane. I was tell- just being helpful. And then we get there and we say, oh, there's a spot over there. Why don't you park over there? She goes, I realized that I was micromanaging every little decision that he was going to make. And what that shows, what that communicates is you don't trust him that he's going to take care of you. And that kills attraction. I love also what you said too, is I would love. And so everybody listening, if you're writing anything down, just saying what I would love is, I think that's such an incredible invitation. And also really funny because by the way, Matt, I've actually done this before. I caught myself. I was in a five-year relationship. That's a whole nother podcast of calling off my wedding years ago. But with this person, amazing guy, but I would do this when we were driving. And it was at the height of my business, you know, so I was in like, get it done mode all day. Mm -hmm. And I would be like, hey, hey, you're gonna miss the exit. And then one day I told myself, (laughs) I'm not gonna control, I I literally had this whole dialogue, so it's so funny you give this example. I was like, I'm not gonna control how he drives. And so one day, I'll never forget, we are sitting on the 405 in Los Angeles, and he told, and I, I watched that he's about to pass our exit. I watch it happening. I told myself, like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to control this. So we slowly just passed the exit. And the old me would have been like, our exit's coming. Our exit's coming. You need to change lanes, you know? So instead, I just kind of smiled as we passed it. And I just looked (laughs) over at him and was like, so we passed our exit, you know? And he just kind of looked at me. And so it's so funny because I committed to this exact exercise. And and your, your example mirrors something that I personally went through. I'm also so curious when it comes to the law of polarity, how to create like even more attraction. So there's masculine and there's feminine and asking for what you would love. Is there any other communication tool to invite a man into his masculine energy and to invite yourself into your feminine energy? Yeah, the the feminine energy is playful energy and present energy. So one of the challenges is that in order to feel safe, we want to know where it's going. Right? We want to know as we start futurizing and imagining kids and imagining us together and imagining all of these things. One of the most beautiful things about being in a relationship, my wife is, uh, is amazing. She's st- super strong, um, powerful, and taught me a lot about this process of masculine and feminine because she wasn't willing, she wasn't willing to be in her masculine in our relationship. Well, on our first date, I picked her up. I was so used to dating these masculine women, strong women. Uh, I pick her up on the date and I get her in the car and I walk her to the car, pick her up at her house. And I say, all right, where do you want to go? And she goes, wait, what? You don't, you don't have a plan for where you want to take me? I was like, well, uh, we were dating long distance. She was in Orange County. I was from the Northwest. So I said, well, I don't, this isn't my area, you know, so I'll just take you wherever you want to go. And she looked at me and she said, actually, I, would, I want you to choose where we're going. I don't want to have to choose where we're going. And she could see I started to get all flustered. I started to get all like, Wah. and I started panicking, not knowing where to go. And she goes, look, let me help you out. I like Italian food and I like sushi. So we can just chill here and look up on your phone. We're, pick a place and I'm happy to go there. And so I chose a sushi place and took her to this place called Tuna Town in Huntington Beach. Yes, what a name, Tuna Town, okay. I say I forever regret the fact that I took my wife to Tuna Town Holy on our first date. Yeah, Matt, come on. Like, what just happened there? Okay. Could have been something way more romantic. She's got to be careful what she wishes for. She's going to end up in Tuna Town. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but, but, uh, but here's the weird thing. Here's the, here's the crazy thing. Because she let me choose the spot. And at the end of the day, it was good sushi. At the end of the day, she thanked me, appreciated me, and celebrated me for a job well done. Mm. She was like, hey, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you so much uh, or for bringing me here. This was a really great decision. That's the line. 
This was a brilliant choice. When you celebrate your man's decision making, when you celebrate his choice that he's making, now it doesn't work if you tell him where to go because he didn't choose it. Mm. You got to let him choose it. You got to let him decide. Celebrating your man for what he's producing for you, the experience that he's giving you. Because ladies, let me tell you, when we take you to a restaurant, we don't feel like we're the one who just took you there. We are so connected to the experience we're trying to give you. It's as if we own the restaurant, we cook the restaurant, and we served it to you, mm-hmm. right? It was like we, we are the creators of that experience. When we walk you on the beach or to in the mountains and we see a beautiful sunset, we feel like we created that for you. Like I built this sunset for you, right? <laughs> and so when you praise our decision-making, that activates our masculine energy because masculine is about co- is being is cognitive vision driven decision energy right so that's a very simple easy thing that you can do to help activate besides being you make the request on the front end and then you bookend it with the celebration and the appreciation on the back end Mm -hmm. when he's earned it celebrate him for it and it will it will you will it'll be amazing how much how much he steps up in his wanting to plan how much he steps up in his wanting to provide we replicate behavior that we receive the most attention for as human beings, okay. whether it's positive or negative attention. We don't, our subconscious mind doesn't differentiate. Whatever the most attention we get, we will replicate that behavior. So rep, so celebrate, put attention on him for the, for the good work he's doing and he'll do more of it. I love that. And I know that we're running out of time. So I guess quickly, um, before we start recording, we talked about understanding the needs of men. And I was like, oh, I can't leave an attraction conversation without this. What are a couple of things you can tell all of us? Because you were saying to me, there's a huge difference between the needs of men and the needs of women. So what are some differentiators here that are key for everybody listening as they're taking notes about cultivating attraction? And what's great is we've already hit on some of these. Mm hmm. So men need to feel one of our greatest fears is inadequacy, that we don't have what it takes, that we're not enough to be able to provide you with the experience you want, whether it's the meal you want or the orgasm you want or the kids that you want or the home that you want or the whatever that you want. Our fear is that we're inadequate and that we can't do it. So the more you reinforce our competency, the more we feel great about ourselves and that we'll be attracted to you based on that, right? Mm -hmm. But there's one other piece uh, to this that's a biochemical piece. I was a biology teacher in a former life here, so I love how how our biology actually is very different between men and women. But one wild experience that happens in us biologically is that Women, you get fired up. One of your one of your beautiful uh, chemicals is oxytocin, and oxytocin fires when you uh, hug, when you connect, when you talk with one another. Simply the act of talking triggers oxytocin. So men, on the other hand, are one of our great activators. is called dopamine. Now we have oxytocin as well. It plays in us. You have dopamine as well. It plays in you. It just works differently in us, and to different degrees. So to simplify this, just think about men get activated with dopamine, women get activated with oxytocin. I mean, even my daughter, my son was born in the hospital. My three and a half year old daughter at the time wants to hold him. She holds him. We let her hold him for like 30 seconds. She's so enamored with this little baby. Babies Babies trigger oxytocin in women, by the way, just the shape of a baby does. And she gets done with holding him and she turns to herself and she goes, that was awesome. Oh my gosh, what a cutie. <laughs> and then she puts her arms in the air and she, and she goes, that was awesome. Oxytocin high. <laughs> and that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh my God, my daughter just got an oxytocin high. That is so funny. I'm watching this real time. So connection, talking, cuddling, touching, all of that is oxytocin. For men, it's achieving. It's achieving a goal. It's being productive. It's being efficient. This is why men will stuff as many uh, clothes in the in the washing machine as possible. We want to do one load, not two. We want to be efficient. <laughs> this is why we take shortcuts. This is why we speak in as few of words as possible. This is why we don't get charged up with talking, right? It's being efficient. We get the, the point of the conversation gets us charged up. What's the point? So it's this uh, – it's this um, – feeling of achievement that we want and doing it with as least amount of energy as possible. That's what fires us up. Here's the problem. 
oxytocin, high levels of oxytocin naturally suppress dopamine. So when you're hanging out with your man and you're feeling great, you're, you've spent three days together, you spent the entire weekend together, you went to a concert and it was awesome, you slept in, you made love in the morning, you went to, you went to Sunday brunch, it was incredible, you guys went on some bike ride on Monday through the woods and through, see the nature and it was just great, you're feeling like so fired up right as you are at the height of your oxytocin. He needs dopamine. Guess what's going on? His dopamine is rock bottom. And what happens when his dopamine is rock bottom? He needs to achieve. He needs to pull. He needs to get away from whatever's crashing his dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This is and so, so ridiculous. And so what happens is women will take this personally. They'll be like, I feel so connected to you. Why don't you feel so connected to me? And evolutionarily, this helped us because... If you were just going to lay by the fire when we were cave people and never wanted to leave the cave because you guys were grunting and talking and making love all day long, he would never want to go out and hunt because it was cold and harsh and hard. This is, how, this is how we've evolved to help us survive. Now, we don't operate under those same rules today, but the, the biochemistry is still there. So, man, we feel this urge to pull away. And so we will want to go hang with the friends. We'll want to go to the gym. We'll want to go work on a project. We'll want to go whatever, whatever to increase our dopamine. And so the best thing a woman can do that helps create attraction in a relationship, maintains that attraction, is encourage dopamine time. Mm. Encourage him to go golf. Encourage him to go play. Encourage him to go, go get with your guys. Like, I'm going to go with my girlfriends. You go do something. Mm. Encourage that separation. And that will help him because his dopamine will come up. And the moment his dopamine is high, guess what he wants to do? Oxytocin hour. <laughs> exactly. He wants to get snuggly with you, right? Amazing. This is so great. <laughs> Gosh, this has been so helpful for everybody listening. I'm sure you're taking notes as I am. Um, Matt, where can everybody find your gift just to remind them? And where can everybody find you in general? So in general, you can go to cracking the man code. Dot com cracking the man code dot com is my main website there's lots of great resources there um, courses and products and free videos and whatnot um, and I put together a great free book for you it's a digital book we call it an ebook and all you have to do is go to cracking the man code dot com forward slash u turn y o u t u r n should have this of Ashley you in this podcast so go to the, go to cracking the man code.com forward slash u turn and the title of this book is five feminine qualities that high value men find irresistible oh it's so gonna serve you you're gonna love it. it's gonna give you a bunch of ideas and uh that's a gift for me to you well that's gonna be useful now that i just listened to you talk about men and dopamine and i'm realizing that i'm i'm a man so thank you for an incredible conversation and for just enlightening all of us and i'm so grateful to have spent this time with you thank you very much it's been a pleasure to be with you Hey guys, it's Ash just reflecting on this episode with Matt Boggs. And oh my God, having guests like him on U-Turn Podcast remind me why I'm doing this work. He's so masterful, isn't he? Like you can tell that he has just spoken and studied and really learned his art and his work. And one of the topics that came up, obviously, that meant a lot to me was self-love. And I cringe at the topic because it sounds like a concept that comes straight out of a yoga class. And those of you who know me know that I totally support you if you do yoga, but I personally haven't found a connection to it yet. I don't know why. It's like my eyes are like dodging around the room and I'm just, you know, too much energy. So I go to spin classes. But what I will say is that the topic of self-love has been so relevant for me. And one of the biggest shocks that I've experienced as an entrepreneur is how many strong, powerful women are falling prey to relationships where they don't love themselves. And I was one of those women. I'll never forget calling off my wedding two, three years ago. And my first relationship after him was a charming, successful, handsome, smooth operator guy. Um, and I'll, I totally fell for him. We ended up being together for about nine or 10 months. But what I found throughout the relationship was that I was afraid to speak up and ask for what I wanted because 
I was afraid he would leave or he would be unhappy or he'd have this big response. And so one of the books I want to recommend to you if you feel like you're sometimes preventing yourself from speaking up because you're afraid of other people's response or you're trying to avoid someone else responding to you in a certain way is the book Codependent No More by, by Melody Beatty. I can't recommend that book enough. You've got to read that book. Um, and what I learned throughout that relationship was how to love myself, how to speak to myself because a lot of people talk about inner child work and I want to kind of open that up right here. And again, a yoga class topic. I don't know why I don't like yoga. I should like it with all of these concepts that I love so much being talked about in them. But no matter who you are, you have that little you inside of you. And I think one of my jobs as a coach, whether I'm working with somebody one-on-one -on -one to help them find their purpose or launch their business or make a career pivot, whatever have you, one of my biggest jobs is to figure out where people's hearts were broken and what stories they told themselves in the moments of their heartbreak. And it doesn't have to be a, a relationship that broke their heart, like a romantic relationship. It could be the moment when you were five years old and somebody stole your favorite necklace or your favorite, you know, backpack and you went through some sort of heartbreak. Because what I've, what I've learned about trauma is it's not that it needs to be a big event. It's the small, nuanced moments that we make stories up about ourselves, about the world around us, and we carry them with us for the rest of our lives. And so one thing that that really rough relationship helped me wake up to when I finally got the power to leave him, and believe me, when I finally left, he kept coming back. He kept texting. I'm so proud of myself for leaving. And what I learned was how to get in touch with my inner child. And so I want to invite you now to explore building a relationship with your inner child. So if you're looking to love yourself more, a great book I love also is called Inner Bonding by Margaret Paul. Uh, but one thing that you could start doing now is every night before you go to bed, just right before you close your eyes, connect with your inner child. So what that looks like is picturing little you in the room next to you, in your mind as an, as an image, and picture yourself as you are now going to visit him or her. So maybe she's, you know, little you is sitting on a park bench and you're going into the park in your imagination and you just want to ask her or him, what's up? How are you feeling? What you're going to find is that in any given moment, especially stressful moments for yourself as an adult, your inner child is usually screaming, wanting something from you, not sure if she or he can trust you to keep her safe. And part of that safety, that relationship you create with the small inner you is in honoring that part of you that's asking for what it wants. So for example, if you're in a relationship right now and there's some little part of you screaming, I'm not safe with you, this isn't healthy for me. That's an opportunity to connect with your inner child and ask her what she needs. Because a lot of the times, if you go into your imagination and you ask your inner child, do you trust me? A lot of you will have inner children that don't trust you because you're not listening to yourself. That inner child is you. So really, if you're not listening to that, you're not listening to you, even if it's a young version of you. It's an ever-knowing, ever-wise version of you, and it wants to feel safe. And you are in charge of your own safety, and that's why it's so important in your relationships in the outer world and with yourself to be able to connect enough to yourself to hear this wise voice inside of you, this cry inside of you, this sadness inside of you. And on the topic of breakups, I ended up after that really tough relationship going into a really loving relationship with somebody for five months. So just lots of different relationships that I've experienced, different flavors of love, if you will. And this one was a really loving relationship. And I remember when we parted ways for all sorts of reasons. My inner child, I was sitting by a pool crying that day and because we ended up breaking up when I was on a vacation. And my inner child was screaming, I'm not important to you. That's what she said, my inner child. And when I looked into it, I was like, why is this, why do I keep hearing little me scream, I'm not important to you? And I realized that her heartbreak was when her dad lost his company and was too busy to be present with her. And that she was continuing to attract men who 
weren't present with her because that was a comfort zone for her. And she wanted to heal what happened to her with her dad by finding somebody that wasn't present with her and teaching them how to be present with her. That's what I was playing out. So I think for you with your inner child, the first step is to start to listen to your body. When your body tenses up in a connection, in a conversation, usually it's it's something your inner child wants you to know or there's an ever-wise voice inside of you. Maybe it's your intuition, your knowing, your instinct, but a lot of the times it's your inner child trying to speak up. And so I just want to invite you for the next two weeks, every night before you go to bed, five minutes before you close your eyes and go to sleep. You know, you can close your eyes visualize yourself going to visit your inner child at a park or maybe there was somewhere that you liked to go when you were a kid and you visualize your little self there go there and just start talking to that person to that version of you and ask what's new how's it doing how's it feeling ask it about different ask little you about different areas of your life how do you feel about my relationship with so and so how do you feel about my career just start asking little you what it feels and ask it what it needs from you Because a lot of the times, little you, this part of you, it's you, it needs something from you that you're not giving it. And that is why you're not creating a level of self-love that really is available. And when you can build a bridge between you and your inner child, that ever wise, honest voice inside of you, when you can listen to it, when you can honor it, when you can fearlessly speak for it, that is an act of self-love that most people haven't yet mastered. Oof, personal, personal after episode conversation. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I'm honored to have shared and um, hit me up on the gram. Let me know what you're thinking or what you're learning from this. This to me, inner child work, it feels really cheesy, but it is really powerful. And I see it time and time again. So can't wait to connect with you next week as per usual. And thank you so much for writing reviews of this podcast, for you know, hitting me up on the gram for sharing this episode with people that you think need it. Oh my God. Thank you so much for helping me get this out there in the world. It really means a lot. Take care. Thanks again for tuning into this week's episode of the U-Turn podcast. We keep really detailed show notes at U-TurnPodcast.com. So if our guest mentioned a book or a resource that you're interested in, you'll be able to find that there. In the meantime, if you were inspired by this episode, if it made an impact in your life, we would be so grateful if you subscribed and posted a review for us on iTunes. Rumor has it on the street, the more reviews we get, the more subscribes we get, the more we can grow and get our impact out there in the world. In the meantime, I'd love to hear from you at Ashley Stahl on Instagram. I'm so grateful for connecting and I look forward to next week's episode.